Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, the show that is part of the Simply Luxurious Life online destination, cultivating true contentment, the art of living a life of quality over quantity. Visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, at our simplified URL, tsll.co, or thesimplyluxuriouslife.com to find the show notes for each podcast episode, as well as much more weekly content to elevate your everyday and deepen your contentment. From a Monday motivational post, recipes, videos of the cooking show series, style and decor inspiration, French and British inspired content, and reader's favorite regular weekly post, This and That, which is posted each Friday morning. Now to today's episode. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 377th episode of The Simple Sophisticate. And welcome to spring or fall, if you are in the Southern Hemisphere. Officially, depending on when you're listening to this episode this week, you are already in spring. But if you're listening right when this episode dropped in the Pacific Northwest, spring will arrive at 8.06 this evening. So cheers to that. And that means 11.06 on the East Coast. 10.06 10.06 Central Time and Mountain Time, 9.06. So with that, I always view the start of spring as a new year. And in some cultures, it is the new year. It's the Persian New Year. It is the seasonal, the gardening season's new year, so to speak. But I do see this as a new year. And I found a book last month that, while I think it would be good no matter when you picked it up and read it, It was recently released in February this year, and it's all about the topic of slow productivity, but not just a general conversation. This is actually a concept that is then broken down into three core principles by the author Cal Newport. I'm going to talk more about exactly what I found and what what I think you'll be interested in. And if this idea speaks to you, I think this is a wonderful way to reset for this new year so that we can elevate the quality of our work wherever our work is, whether we are our own boss, which I know many listeners who tune into this podcast are, but I also know many, many, many more have a boss or are tied to a schedule they don't have a lot of control over. However, I think having read this book that there are ideas that we can all implement to elevate the workday which ultimately will elevate our everyday, which ties in beautifully to living simply luxuriously. So the topic of today's episode is the slow productivity approach that will elevate the quality of your entire life as taught by Cal Newport. But before I get to that, this week's Petit Plaisir in many ways also is in celebration of spring. It is a documentary I recently saw and absolutely loved. It will take you to Europe. It will take you into, well, I'm giving too much away already. Stay tuned and I'll share more about that film at the end of today's episode. Now to today's topic. Let's begin with a quote from the book, Slow Productivity, The Lost Art of Accomplishment Without Burnout by Cal Newport. Quote, What's needed is more intentional thinking about what we mean by productivity. If we collect modest drops of meaningful effort for 365 days, we'll end the year with a bucket that is pretty damn full. This is what ultimately matters, where we end up, not the speed at which we get there or the number of people we impress with our jittery busyness along the way. Whether or not our constant need to check email or be involved in multiple projects at once 
or filling our schedule so full that squeezing in a short vacation seems to be a struggle, whether it stems from our need to please or our drive to succeed or our feelings of insecurity, it is nearly, but not entirely irrelevant. What takes priority is an acknowledgement that none of these habits or approaches to work, whether we work for ourselves or someone else, will ever produce the best quality of work. And in so doing will actually leave us unnecessarily depleted. If we're at work or working in our office at home, nobody can say we aren't giving what is required. And the same can be said for checking our email frequently or our phone frequently or the news frequently. Whatever the outlet is that gives the appearance that we are not being left behind and are working as often as possible, often is why we embrace the busyness. Because it's what most of what the culture, how they define work, what they accept. If they see you at a computer, if they see you checking your email, if they, if you appear physically busy, then you must be getting something done. But is that true? Part of the reason we accept busyness has a lot to do with not knowing and our attempts at trying to, at least to our lizard mind, put the odds in our favor. In other words, if we don't understand how our mind works, our ego runs the show and tries to do all that it can do to simply survive. And that means trying to control all that it can, including attempting to control what it cannot, errantly thinking, however, that it can. And so by our constant doing, we think we are helping, but actually we are getting in our own way. Now, over the past handful of years, I've written a couple of posts and episodes about letting go of being busy. And and I want to bring your attention to episode 115, the eight benefits of banishing busy. And I've linked it in the show notes, but I recommend you checking it out because you start to understand how you start to nourish your entire life by letting go of this concept of being busy. And it is something that we've accepted as normal um, that isn't helping us. So I've linked that on the show notes if you want to check that out. Episode 115, The Eight Benefits of Banishing Busy. So back to this idea of the mind. The mind wants to know what it can't know. We can't know if we're going to get that pay rise or pay raise tomorrow. We can't know, and I say tomorrow, but I mean in the future, we can't know if our business is going to be a super success 10 years down the road, five years down the road. The idea is we don't know what tomorrow brings, but yet by doing more constantly in the now, we think, well, at least we're doing everything we can. But actually, we may be thwarting the progress we are seeking. But that is when knowing our mind is going to help. So let's talk about that. Once we take the time to know our mind, and that is something I've talked about on my podcast and in blog posts intermittently over the years. And I'm actually going to really dive deeply into how to know your mind, how to master it, and to understand why it does what it does in a very approachable manner in the Contentment Masterclass video course that I'm launching in June 2024. It's uh, one of the many lessons, I have eight full lessons um, on how to cultivate contentment, but one of the lessons is about mastering your mind and really breaking down how it affects the quality of our life. So when we understand our mind, and why it reverts to the lizard mind by default, we then can understand and recognize when it does this and not fall prey to listening and then doing what it thinks is gonna be helpful, which is simply to survive. And we want to thrive. We can bring it back to the sage mind and trust that in letting go, in other words, It's okay to walk away from the office at five o'clock, four o'clock, whenever you leave. It's okay not to check your email over the weekend for your work, uh, your place of work. It's okay to set boundaries. All will be well. And of course, it depends largely on the quality of work you're putting in when you are there. But you do need to protect your energy and your creative ideas. And that, as we'll talk about, is nourished when you're not constantly forcing it to be on all the time. Not only will we not falter by putting these boundaries up and slowing down, we will not get behind and will actually get ahead. In fact, we are opening up our lives and thus the quality of our productivity to become better quality. 
author and professor of computer sciences at Georgetown University, Cal Newport's latest book, Slow Productivity, The Lost Art of Accomplishment Without Burnout, details exactly how and where in our daily lives and throughout the year we can apply this slow productivity approach and why it works. In today's episode, I'm going to share with you 10 takeaways that caught my eye as areas of interest I thought would interest you as listeners. And if what you discover or hear in today's episode speaks to you, I encourage you to pick up the book because there's far more detail, far more examples. In fact, the list I actually made for myself personally is two pages long, and these are very specific things I'm going to add to my professional and ultimately overall life because it affects my personal and, and overall life. But 10 things are, are things that I think will at least give you a good bite, a good nugget of what slow productivity looks like and why it's worth doing. And um, I zoomed through this book once I started reading it. I finished it in less than 24 hours or fewer than 24 hours because I just wanted to keep gobbling up his ideas. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Oh, I didn't think about that. Or, oh, yeah, I can do this, Shannon. Be brave. <laughs> Set that boundary. Um, anyway, so the book is called Slow, Up, Slow Productivity. And what I'm going to do today is, is share with you um, – how his ideas, so I'm going to show you very specific things he does and, and suggests, and how they dovetail and overlap, I should say, into living simply luxuriously. Because as is made clear from the name given in his approach, slow productivity, the concept of quality versus quantity is the key that runs through slow productivity, something that the Simply Luxurious Life community is all too familiar with as we individually are creating and cultivating our simply luxurious lives. So let's get started with number one. Right out of the gate, delegate, hire, or eliminate daily life tasks. So a quote from the book, the advantage of doing fewer things is about more than just increasing the raw numbers of hours dedicated to useful activity. The quality of of these hours also increases, and he italicizes quality in his quote. So Newport lays out three core concepts that define what slow productivity requires. And the first is do fewer things. Common sense, yes, easy to do, not necessarily, but absolutely necessary. So the first example he cites is Jane Austen and her ability to write as many novels as she did, and successful novels by the, <laughs> as well as she did in such a short amount of time. Um, not only a short amount of time because she didn't live a long life, she died in her early 40s. Um, but if you look at when she actually published all these books, it was actually in a very, very short window in her 30s. And she wasn't writing all of these over long durations of time. And he dispels the inaccuracies regarding when she actually had time to write and brings to our awareness that it isn't until she is able to, quote, abstract herself from the daily life going on around her that she was able to find her literary voice, end quote. He goes on to point out the ignorance or privilege of how so many white male writers of the past and arguably some in the future who extol the simplicities of doing more and better work and forget that someone else was or is tending to the daily must do tasks such as making meals, going to the market, cleaning the house, caring for the children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I appreciate him at least acknowledging that. He doesn't dive deeply into that, but he does acknowledge it and I sincerely appreciated that. Um, with that knowledge in mind, examine all of the daily tasks you assume you alone have to do. And I, I do want to use that verb assume. I want you to be brutally honest with yourself. This is something we have talked about before in various contexts, but the reason at its core remains the same for doing so, to free up your mind and time so that you actually have the energy and open space in mind to let it be both free to connect disparate ideas as well as have the energy to bring it to fruition. So even if you, so you hire someone to do something that you normally do, but if you're constantly hovering, you're, don't trust that they're going to do a good job. Your mind is not free. You really have to make sure that you've invested well in someone to do whatever it is you need them to do or whatever it is, whether it's actual phys monetary payment or just trusting that they're going to do a good job. So that you can mentally be free. 
So let's specifically focus on work. What can you remove from your plates that because you think you alone have to do it, the tasks that you really want to sink your teeth into lose time and lose creative focus from you because you are interrupted and multitasking or whatever it might be. So for me, an example is that tending to the website, the hiccups or the updates that will inevitably come up along the way when you have a website. Over the past year, there was a lot of precious time that I had to give and stress levels rose because I was tending to things outside of what was my expertise and outside of what I wanted to give my time to, writing and creating. And because I wasn't an expert in these fields, it took prolonged time and caused more unnecessary stress that further drained from my creativity. However, we all have to learn somehow. And when we take the time to acknowledge where a wise investment would be to give us back more time that we are actually losing, if only we would stop trying to do everything, the quality of both our work as well as our well-being and our mood, etc., increases. Needless to say, hiring a web consultant, something Newport actually suggests in the book, is a wise idea. In other words, initially you may be thinking, I can't afford this. I don't need this. I can tend to it myself. I've been there. I've done that. I, 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 there are some things that I have taught myself and I will continue to do. But there are others that are absolutely unnecessary because there are only so many hours in the day and there's only so many hours in the day that I am rested and fully able to create um, before my energy level goes down. And that's not because, you know, of anything. It's just the reality of being a human being. Um, and I know that that is not um, unique to me. As a teacher, there are only so many hours that you are on. So what can you do? Can you get a teacher's aid? Can you, um, whatever it might be, so that you can really go in and create this awesome new lesson that you have been dreaming about and you know your kids are going to love. Figure out how to delegate. So again, it doesn't have to cost money, but it may require you to trust someone else to do something. And it may take time. I will say this. Sometimes it's going to take a couple go rounds. <laughs> this has happened to me. It takes a couple go rounds to find the right person. And you have to be also strong enough to let people go and say, this isn't working, but I'm going to keep trying to find someone. This all leads me to the second point. So the first point, just to remind, was delegate, hire, or eliminate daily life tasks so that you can preserve the time and energy you have to work well on your whatever it is you're doing. Two is do whatever you can to reduce the overhead tax. Quote, doing fewer things makes us better at our jobs, not only psychologically, but also economically and creatively. Focusing intensely on a small number of tasks, waiting to finish each before bringing on something new is objectively a much better way to use our brains to produce valuable output. Cal Newport. So overhead tax. Newport describes it as the ongoing administrative overhead, quote, the back and forth email threads or meeting schedule to synchronize with your collaborators, end quote. Ultimately, these are things that while necessary in theory can be simplified if looked at with um, intention. So while we may think we can handle two, three, or four projects, it's often not the project itself that bogs us down, but all of the overhead tax that comes with each project. Now, we don't have to accept so much overhead tax, but if we aren't going to change how we communicate and organize with others that we work with on the project to reduce the overhead tax, we need to first begin by working on one project at a time. But wait, some of you may be saying, I don't have a choice about how many projects I work on uh, with regards to where you particularly work. So first, I would ask you to examine that response. But then if you have to have more than one project, begin by changing the culture of how you tend to the overhead taxes. So in other words, when you write emails, this is something Newport uh, directly talks about, make sure you have a very clear purpose for writing them, communicate your purpose succinctly, but with as much detail as possible and necessary. So you don't want to be long-winded. You're going to have to be very clear. So you're going to, you're going to be responsive in your emails. You're going to think very clearly before you click send and ask yourself, do I need to send this? And have I included everything? And have I clearly communicated what I need to communicate? Knowing your audience. And you do this to prevent as much back and forth as you can. Clarity and simplicity. So that you can complete projects or tasks without interruptions. 
and you can communicate when you are ready or available to collaborate. So you will res- let people know that you will respond by email at a certain on a certain day or by a certain time of day or within 48 hours, whatever it might be, or let people know and make it very consistent and clear across the board when colleagues or students can pop by your office by setting office hours. He has a lot of great ideas for creating these boundaries to eliminate the overhead tax. Um, but I used to th- I think back to my teaching days, I set very specific office hours. And I remember there were some teachers that had an open door policy every single after school. I'm like, I just couldn't do that. I had to have some days after school that I could know that the door wouldn't keep opening and students wouldn't keep asking for things. It wasn't that I didn't want to help them, but I wanted to make sure that I was able to get my job done and be prepared the next day and have their work corrected. So when I clearly communicated up front, these are the two days and I will be here after school until a certain hour or whatever time that was, all the time, always, and if not, I will let you know, which was ever very, very rarely. I had so many students coming in because they could, they knew they could trust that I was gonna be there. And I tended to every single one of them, even if it was a totally different class, because it often was. Um, And so I was trying to make sure that I was prepared for all of them. And that's the other thing, too. You're prepared to talk to your colleagues or your students because you know what is expected of you as well. Um, But this clear communication, this consistency um, eliminates the overhead tax and frees you up the other days or other hours so that you can work and not be interrupted. All right, so that's number two, do whatever you can to reduce the overhead tax. Number three, make available fewer options. Quote, slow productivity requires that you free yourself from the constraints of the small so that you can invest more meaningfully in the big, end quote. If you run a business or are offering services of any kind, choose fewer options to purchase or hire out for. In other words, rather than being spread too thin and potentially reducing the quality of output, choose the items that both your clients will want the most or trust you to provide and what you can most provide well and dependably. This could also mean taking on fewer clients at a particular time or, you know, if once you have a certain number, you don't take on any more and you let the people that want to be your client, hey, this is the timeline when I'll likely be available. You can either wait for me or go find someone else. But at least you you are respecting that you're going to make sure the quality of work you give to the clients you do hire or work with is paramount. It is not sacrificed. And just because you have blank space on your schedule, and I, I say that on paper you have blank space, doesn't mean you have to fill it with new clients or new projects or new additional tasks. Newport reminds that no matter how much time we have, often we are very adept at filling that time. So if, for example, yesterday I had all morning scheduled to write this episode, it looks like blank space because all I wrote was write episode 377 and then there's about four hours below that that are empty. Do not feel that space. It just allowed me more time to make sure this episode was the best I could make it. All right. And I wasn't editing either. I was, oh, no, no, you'll have enough time to edit it as well, Shannon, and produce it. No, Shannon, you're going to do that the next day. You know yourself. And you know that quality arrives when you have less to do so you can focus and go deeply. So that's number three, fewer options. And to, to that point, how are how are you going to trust that you can fill fill that time even if nothing's on the calendar physically when you become engrossed in the project you've chosen this project it is one that you want to work on you're passionate about there's something about it that has has caught your attention we step into that flow of creation and ultimately a project or or the task that we're working on benefits however if we are jumping from one client or one project to the next we stop ourselves while we have momentum and the quality or that train of thought suffers, that idea that was going to eventually pop up never comes to light because we stopped and we're interrupted. All right, so that's number three, fewer options. Number four, focus on one major project a day. Quote, there's a calibrated steadiness to working on just one major initiative a day. Real progress accrues while anxiety is subdued, end quote. For knowledge workers, which is primarily who Newport shares that he wrote this book for, 
However, I do find, and I shared this at the top of the episode, that anyone can find takeaways to deepen the quality of, of their work approach. Choosing to focus on only one primary project each day ensures more progress and quality progress will be accomplished. Now, this is not to say, for example, that you won't respond to emails that are unrelated to the project or take phone calls or potentially touch bases with other clients on a project throughout the day, but prioritizing where you are going to focus your energy and largest chunk of time on any given workday will deepen the focus and the final output. When I look at the schedule for my week after having read his book, I acknowledge that whenever I had a day on the calendar that contained two major projects that I would would want to, I mean, you want to do more, something you don't want to do more. It's it's you just being cognizant of what you can do well. Whenever those days arise, those days are often the most exhausting and cause the most stress. And it is on those days when I only focus on one major project and then sprinkle in some small tasks to complete at the end of the day that my days feel lighter, but I also have accomplished more and more that I'm proud of. I'm taking note of this and I'm constantly adapting and and tweaking. And as I mentioned, I have two pages worth of ideas I'm going to add to my, my schedule as far as tweaking and editing based on reading his book. So as you too look at your work schedule, examine realistically when you can give the most time to each project you're, you are working on. You likely will have to plan ahead so that you don't fall behind because you're going to appear to be slowing down in productivity on paper. But actually what is slowing down is your rushing, which ultimately delays the project as you will have to give it more time down the road or go back and correct mistakes or deepen the output that isn't as polished as you would like. And I think that's the beautiful reminder here. And this is where planning ahead helps. Not that you're not going to tweak it. That's the other thing. For example, when you're working on a project that you want to launch in six months time, you're giving yourself buffers so that you might finish early, but you don't have to rush. And since you're only going to have one main project on every single workday, no matter what that project is, it's only one main project you're focusing on, you're not going to double up. And so nothing's going to suffer as it would if you had doubled up and you did that consistently. So that's number four, focus on one major project a day. Number five, connect a reoccurring task, it's a have-to task, to a ritual of enjoyment and create an autopilot approach for this task. So if you have a weekly or monthly task, for example, that is a have to, and while it's not horrible, it just isn't something that you most look forward to. It's not something super enjoyable, like doing the budget, for example, or doing payroll. Why not pair it with something that is enjoyable? It could be where you tend to this task. So take yourself out of the office, for example, and always do this task at a favorite bistro. I know a teacher who, there's a nearby coffee shop um, to the high school and on certain uh, days of the week, he takes his papers and he goes and grades them at the coffee shop just to get a change of scenery. He's literally within walking distance of the school um, and can walk to and from, you know, just in time, but it just gives him a new atmosphere to do a task that he has to do. That's an important task, but it also gives him a bit of a, a different change of environment. You might go to, like I said, a cafe or bistro, or maybe you go to a library nook, but be sure that you turn your VPN on, your your, uh, virtual private network, um, if you're using a computer. And maybe that's the other thing. You're not using a computer. This is something that's going to take you out of the office so you don't check your email. So it really depends on you and your workload. Or it might be not while you're actually doing it, but it might be something that you do prior to. So as you're going to do that task, you do this thing or just after as a reward. So maybe you have to meet with your accountant every first day of the month to settle the books. What you do before, however, is an absolute delight because it involves walking through a beautiful park that you normally aren't in proximity to. But each month you are because of where you meet with your um, accountant. Giving yourself time to enjoy the walk elevates the quality of the have to experience and creates a ritual that you look forward to. So this is where you're really designing your workday. Um, Even if you work for someone else, what is it you can do at the end of a particular day of the week before you go home that you let yourself savor 
because on that particular work day, it's always a really stressful day for whatever reason. Maybe there's a particular thing that always happens. Maybe it's after a staff meeting or maybe it's after conferences or, and again, I'm using lots of teacher examples. I know a lot of the listeners are teachers and I, but I was a teacher, so I'm trying to use those examples, but you have things in your work life that you regularly have to do. If you can tie it to something that's very enjoyable, it does not have to be work related at all. In fact, it probably shouldn't be. Then it, you turn the day into something that you look forward to. And that's how we start to elevate our life. Now, if you can eliminate that thing, do it, do it, delegate it, do it. But if you can't, this is how you um, make it much more enjoyable. That's number five. How is your sock drawer looking? Now that it's spring has arrived, spring cleaning and a refresh may just be in order. And Bombas just dropped a bunch of absurdly soft new socks, tees, and underwear to help you get that drawer in a better place while doing a little good. Once you start wearing Bombas, you'll never look at socks the same way. They're obsessed over details like foot hugging, honeycomb arch support, anti blister tabs, and cushioned footbeds that feel like little pillows for your feet, not to mention buttery soft tees and underwear with no itchy tags. And Bombas has a one purchased, one donated mission. Every time you buy their socks, tees, or underwear, you also donate essential clothing to someone facing homelessness. To date, Bombas has donated over 100 million clothing items and counting. And with a 100% happiness guarantee, Bombas is the sock to purchase. If the dryer or your dog eats a sock, or if you're unhappy with your purchase for virtually any reason, they'll do whatever they can to replace it and make it right. Now, I can speak to this because when Nell was a puppy, she did chew some of my socks. And so I reached out to Bombas and these socks had been around for about a year or so. They were in great shape until she got hold of them. They replaced them for free. Bombas has new garden party socks woohoo! that bring the party to your feet. They've got stripes and florals, new vintagey colored rib socks, and even a new point tail sock with a frilly cuff for all you frill seekers out there. They've also got merino wool blend socks because winter sometimes hangs on for some of us, as we know here in Bend, that naturally wick moisture and help regulate temperatures, perfect for that rainy and unpredictable spring weather. I have been wearing Bomba socks for more than four years, and I absolutely love them. They are my go-to socks for all of my outdoor activities. Whether it's a mid-high sock or an ankle sock or a no-show sock, I wear them year-round. And you can too. As a listener of the Simple Sophisticate podcast, get comfy this spring and give back with Bombas. Head over to bombas.com slash sophisticate and use code sophisticate for 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash sophisticate and use sophisticate at checkout. The Simple Sophisticate is also sponsored by Oak Essentials. I am so excited to introduce you to a new skincare brand that I have been thoroughly enjoying. Oak Essentials is a line full of luxurious products that really work, especially if you're trying to achieve that natural no makeup look. And here is why I think you'll want to give them a try. Oak Essentials were founded in 2021 by the team behind Jenny Kane. Oak Essentials is known for its simple approach to self-care with a lineup of foundational skincare staples made with high quality ingredients that drive results. They aim to unlock healthy, glowing skin with decadent and hydrating ingredients that give you a luxe, dewy glow. And not just for the face, for the body as well. I have been loving their luminous body lotion, and it was immediately the first thing I put on when their products arrived, and I have been keeping it in my office, applying it throughout the day, absolutely love the subtle scent and the moisturizer it gives to my hands. With Oak Essentials Approach to Aging, they are helping you look and feel beautiful and your best at every age. And spring has arrived, and Oak Essentials is the perfect way to refresh your routine with quality, luxurious self-care. From their moisture-rich balm, a nutrient-rich balm that supports collagen production and delivers serious hydration for a luminous glow, use this balm during daytime and a little goes a long way. Apply generously in the evening to lock in moisture as you dream 
and this balm will make you want to never wear makeup again. Oak Essentials only uses the best ingredients. In this balm, you will find C buckhorn fruit oil, the highest vegetal source of vitamin C, E, and unsaturated fatty acids, including omega-7, which effectively supports collagen production. Plus, it's rich in beta carotene, an antioxidant powerhouse that's known to fight free radical damage and slow the aging process. It also contains organic cocoa seed butter that is exceptionally high in antioxidants. Raw cacao is shown to block free radicals as well while promoting and renewing collagen. And they use organic coconut oil, which contains high levels of an effective emollient and skin softener, phenolic acid and lyric acid to provide strong antimicrobial properties, which is shown to help kill bacteria and reduce inflammation. You can buy the moisture-rich balm on its own or as a part of one of Oak Essentials' best-selling bundles for a simple start-to-finish skincare routine. Not to mention, it makes a perfect gift for any skincare lover in your life. The routine product bundle includes moisture-rich balm, ritual oil, cleansing balm, balancing mist, and the restorative mask. As a simple, sophisticated listener, treat yourself or someone you love this season. Enjoy 15% off plus a free organic honey-based restorative mask with your first order when you use the special promo code SIMPLE15 at checkout. That's 15% off plus a gift with your first order at oakessentials.com, O-A-K-E-S-S-E-N-T-I-A-L-S.com. And don't forget to use the promo code SIMPLE15. So go ahead and treat yourself from luxurious skincare to meaningful self-care. You deserve it. Welcome back. Now let's dive into the final five remaining ways to embrace slow productivity and elevate the quality not only of our work, but of our entire lives. Number six, permit yourself to take longer within limits. So I mentioned that there are three principles of slow productivity, and I've already shared the first, do fewer things. The, the second is, um, the second principle is work at a natural pace. And so when he suggests we take longer with projects that require some or a lot of elements of creativity, I have to say this is a very, very smart idea, especially speaking from a creative standpoint. Um, but in, in many ways, there's so many things that are creative based almost everything is if you really think about it and we are human beings and so we're bringing our energy and our ideas to it so he cites lynn manuel miranda um, and his writing of in the heights and how it took more than seven years to finally become the play that would begin to put miranda on the broadway map but during those seven years he wasn't always working on in the heights but rather letting it evolve and mature naturally based on his maturity as a writer and his experiences, taking feedback, et cetera, and many other seemingly non-related details that life provided during that time. So let's take a look at an example. If you're, if you're writing a book or you're creating an online offering, you have this idea, you know it's going to happen, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be given out to the world at some point. The key here is not to rush it out to the world. Don't put it out as soon as you possibly can. Let it marinate, carry it with you. And what you will find is that you will have bursts of creativity that will advance the project far more quickly than you imagined all of a sudden. And then you will also have moments of pause and setting it aside. And because you didn't set a deadline that was too soon or, or so immediate, you can be patient and then readdress when you are energized. And I think about this a lot, not only with my books, because it usually takes about four years for a book to come out. Um, it actually literally has been four years between every book. But I think about this online, uh, my first online video course, the Contentment Masterclass. I've been thinking about this for years. And, you know, pulling out all the curriculum together, as I mentioned before, has taken over a year almost two years. And then it was just a matter of, okay, now designing how you're going to video it and what the production of it's going to be like. And then once I started to see that all the pieces were there, then I set a deadline. And I was pretty generous with that deadline. As I mentioned, the course is going to become available uh, on the first day of summer, actually. Um, so we have one more season to go. But I didn't set that date until I knew I had all the pieces. I knew eventually this course was going to be available. 
but I didn't have enough of the pieces in my mind's eye to know that, yeah, this is how it's going to work. Yes, I feel really confident about this. Um, I'll be proud of this when I put it out. The same though happens with books. And this is going to happen probably with a lot of projects, all different projects, no matter what you work on. It takes a couple years to go, to be re-energized after putting out a book, in my case. After those two years, I have some ideas that I'm playing with. I'm like, okay, that works. Okay, that. Then for about a year, I'm writing the book, like putting it actually together, writing it. And then the next year is the editing and the fine tuning and the marketing and the designing of the book. So it takes time and I've never rushed it um, because I had other income streams. For a long time, it was teaching, as many of you know. Um, but this is, this is why going at a natural pace with whatever you're trying to create is going to to reveal to you the benefits by the time you get to the end product. Like, okay, I would have never come to that idea had I been rushing this because that a life event hadn't happened yet if I had to put the deadline prior to it. I think it's just something to to consider. Think about nature. And we'll talk about nature in a minute, another another point, but um, permit yourself to take longer. Of course, within limits. That's why you do eventually set a deadline and then you start planning um, specifically. But that's number six. Number seven, we're going to stay in this realm of, 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 of natural pace. After completing big projects, schedule rest projects. Now, similar to the rituals we shared um, above in point number uh, five, when you know a particular project you are working on is going to take an immense amount of time, effort, and temporary sacrifice, whether it's your social and family time, for example, that would have to be limited during this period, ahead of time, schedule a rest project to immediately follow the completion of the big project. So in some ways, this rest project can be viewed as a carrot, a reward for completing your big project. But even if you are thoroughly engrossed in your big project, it will serve your creative energies well to do something that is less demanding or taxing afterward. So you may say, wait a second, my adrenaline's going. I want to create another project. And you likely have that project in your back of your mind and your ideas are flowing, but don't put yourself on the hook for it. The rest projects don't have to be work-related, but they can be. Let me explain. If you can give yourself a project that doesn't require as much connection with team workers, so it gives you time alone to just recharge and not have to be on a particular schedule, uh, maybe it's a solo project that you can self-direct, this would be a rest project. So it's anything that helps basically rejuvenate you or is less taxing. But if you can step away from work, it may be your vacation or it may be giving yourself permission to take an afternoon off each week to do something that you enjoy that is entirely non-work related. So something you would never have done in the middle of that big project because it was all consuming. Whatever it is, the nudge here is to help you relinquish any regret or guilt you have for not continuing at the pace you were traveling while working at your big project. Put simply, you cannot continue at such a demanding pace without something suffering. So be preventative and schedule a rest project. So that's number seven. Number eight, become comfortable saying no to opportunities in the short term. So one of the main individuals he focuses on in this section of the book is the singer and songwriter Jewel. And I want to kick this uh, point off with a quote from her. Hardwood grows slowly. So this introduces the third principle. The third principle of slow productivity is obsess over quality. And he cites in detail the journey that Jewel went on, both of her introduction uh, into the music industry as well as throughout her time in the music industry, as an example to saying no in the short term based on what you want your long-term goal to be. Now, once you have adopted the previously shared principles of doing fewer things and letting our projects unfold at a natural pace, inevitably our time will be taken up for longer periods of time by the few projects we choose to engage with, meaning we won't have time to accept other invitations that may be tempting in the short term. 
Now, Newport argues that it is in the obsession over quality, quote, that slowness can transcend its role as just one more strategy and instead become a necessary imperative, an engine that drives a meaningful professional life, end quote. And when we are obsessed with quality, we pay attention to all the details of our life and how they are contributing or distracting from what we are trying to do, which leads me to talk about last Monday's motivational post, which I wrote that was inspired from this book, um, emphasizing the importance of choosing high quality leisure pastimes to be part of our daily life. And you can link, you can click through on that link and it'll take you to a detailed list. Um, I share not only the reasons for doing it, but also all sorts of examples of what high quality leisure activities are. And a re the reason why I say pastimes, um, I, I think I just said activities there, but I meant pastimes because not all of them are doing things. Some of them are being things. And all of these pastimes that are of high quality are not directly related to our project that we are working on. When we choose these with intention, we are creating an enriched way of living, something we talked about in, in a previous episode, episode 373, about cultivating the hearth and home for your creative being, your creative ideas. But this is for all of us as well. Indirectly, what results is amazing and serendipitous as dots connect and inspire and provide ideas we may not have seen had we not taken part or explored other areas of interest that on the surface were not connected, but most wonderfully open windows of discovery. So by saying no to short-term have-tos, we give ourselves time to have and delve deeply into these pastimes and often that is when magical and unexpected moments and ahas come to life. And when we become obsessed with quality in all areas of our life, saying no to tasks and activities that will dilute that quality becomes far easier. In fact, quote, once you commit to doing something very well, busyness becomes intolerable, end quote. So that's number eight. Become comfortable saying no to opportunities in the short term. Number nine, invest in and maintain quality tools and or equipment. Quote, if we want our mind on board with our plans to evolve our abilities, then investing in our tools is a good way to start. End quote. An investment in yourself and your dedication to do the project well can require various equipment, perhaps a camera or a microphone or computer. However, it is when we invest that we are also upping the stakes to ensure we do the job well. We are betting on ourselves. Quality doesn't always beget quality if we don't know how to use the tool, but this item that I'm including on today's list is taking into account that you are a knowledgeable professional who knows what equipment is needed to do your job well. But maybe you are hemming and hawing about putting down the investment to purchase that particular item that will ensure that you can do what you want to do. I can remember when I made the, what seemed to be at the time, big step to purchase my first Apple laptop as opposed to my PC laptop. And I shared in my first book that it was the best major investment I made in my blogging and writer, writing trajectory at that time because the new laptop performed without hiccups. There was no lag time, no snags. And I was able to work on projects without interruption and not have to give any time to fixing or waiting for my computer to work. More time, better quality of work, less stress. This has continued with upgrading my microphone for this podcast and so many other upgrades that to someone on the outside may seem unnecessary. But when we know what we need to be able to do what we do and do it well, it isn't a want, it's a need. And it shows you are dedicated to quality in your work and you're betting on yourself. So that's number nine. Invest in and maintain quality tools and or equipment. And last but not least, number 10, embrace and perhaps create seasonal seasonality, at least small seasonality in your work. So similar to number seven, um, this idea we talked about, about follow any big project with a rest project, similar to number seven, this is on a grander scale. Um, be reminded that there is value in regular rest of the mind, the body, 
and our being. And when we know we will have this regularly, it becomes more motivating and inspiring to give well while we are working. Long-term vision is required. So we have to live with intention and have a purpose as to why we are doing something. Simply just making it through the days will in the end reduce the quality of those days as they unfold into the future. So educators come to mind when the idea of seasonality is discussed because we have one year, around 190 days of seat time with our students, give or take, to teach the students in such a way that they will be proficient in the desired objectives set by the particular course we are teaching. But then, then we all know that summer break will arrive for all of us. Even students need a break for their minds. And we need to remember this after we step away from the classroom and into our jobs and careers that often do not have a summer break, so to speak. So if taking a summer break isn't a possibility, which I know it isn't for everyone, Newport suggests implementing small seasonality. Maybe each week a particular day becomes off limits with regards to any activity that you don't enjoy. So maybe he, he suggests a no meetings Monday. So while you will have meetings, you just make sure you never schedule a meeting on Monday. Um, and just, so it's literally a break every single week for the entire year on Monday. Or when it comes to your leisurely pastimes that we talked about in number eight, you embrace the idea of rituals that you look forward to and you sprinkle them daily, weekly, and monthly, and seasonally throughout your calendar, and you do them regularly, and you don't feel guilty about them. This elevates the quality of your day-to-day, -day and it gives you something to look forward to. But I want to get back to this big seasonality. So those are small seasonality ideas, and he has many more in the book, by the way, on that. Um, but the big seasonality ideas, if you have the ability to design your own schedule, so you are your own boss, um, choose one or two months a year where you turn down the dial on your workload and expectations of yourself. Perhaps even take those months, one or two months, entirely off. And don't just stay where you are. Go and visit or stay somewhere that will nourish and stimulate your ideas. The example, and he uses a lot of different people throughout history in this book, but the example he uses for this one is Marie Curie, who won the Nobel Prize um, in physics, was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize. And then she won a second Nobel Prize um, in 1911, so 1903 and 1911. And she would take two entire months off from her work in the lab to spend time in the French countryside with her husband and daughter regularly. Um, clearly it paid off. I mean, not all of us are going to go win a Nobel Prize, but this is the point. To win a Nobel Prize, you don't need to be working 12 months out of the year. You do need to rejuvenate. You do need to be inspired by things that are seemingly unrelated, but often just living life and putting the dots together, making it leisurely activities that are of high quality, magic can occur. And as I mentioned, it isn't as though our minds aren't collecting information or working, but rather they are free to relax and energize so that when we come back to work, we are recharged. So that's number 10. Embrace seasonality in your work. Living well involves working well, and working well requires conscious choices and intentional practices that value quality work production. The beautiful paradox, once again, is that by investing in quality rather than quantity, our work's quality rises and it begins with our valuing living well overall. Slow productivity is an approach to explore as it will absolutely contribute to a life of quality over quantity. Our mind and our body will thank us and the legacy we leave behind will be something we are proud of to have completed. Again, the book that inspired today's episode, episode 377, was Slow Productivity, The Lost Art of Accomplishment Without Burnout. And I've linked to the book on the show notes. Now, we have a petite plaisir to get to and I'll be right back to share with you what that is. So last week, um, I felt fortunate to be able to go watch this film. And the film is a documentary titled Painting the Modern Garden, Monet to Matisse. And it's made available by exhibitions on screen. And these are really boutique films. And 
we have a lovely small theater nearby Bend that has regularly been bringing in these art films. They showcase these exhibits that, as we know, exhibits in a in a art gallery or museum only are opened for a short duration, and then all the pieces have to go back to their original homes or original museums. But for you know four to six months, so to speak, depends on the museum and the exhibit. All of these pieces are in one place to talk about a particular theme. And this exhibit actually was on display in London at the Royal Academy of Arts in 2016. And the film originally came out then, but it has now been, it's coming back out again, which I'm grateful for because I did not see it in 2016 because this boutique theater had different owners then. But what I love about these films, exhibitions on screen, is that you get to go around the world, so in this case it was to London, into this exhibit and see all these paintings, but also have the curators of this exhibit talk you through why they chose the art and then also take you back into history and introduce you to the artists and then show all this backstory that yes, you can read in the booklets and you can read in the catalogs they provide. Of course you can, but this is more of a immersive experience without the plane ticket. Now I don't mind flying. I know many of you don't either. It's not that it's just, like I said, these are only open for three to six months often. And if we haven't scheduled to be in London or Paris or wherever the exhibit is at that time, we're going to miss it. So this, these are fantastic opportunities to explore art. But in this case, because the reason I chose this film for our Petit Plaisir is this is actually a lot of videography of the real gardens. So Giverny uh, up in Normandy and a handful of other artists, but it's primarily Monet's garden. I will say it's largely Monet's garden and you're in the garden in real time in 2016, listening to his gar the gardener of the, of the place now and also reading from his, um, not from his new biography, which I absolutely loved because that was just released in 2023 about Monet. I highly recommend it. But there are all sorts, of, all sorts of books about Monet and his garden out there. Anyway, back to the film, Painting the Modern Garden. So this film is definitely for three different people. It's for people who love the Impressionist era, because all of the painters they look at are from the Impressionist era. This is for gardeners. And this is for people who enjoy visiting museums and specifically very thoughtfully curated exhibits around a central theme. And as spring has sprung, <laughs> the vernal equinox has sprung, um, this was such a motivator to sit down prior to this past weekend before I stepped out into my garden fully and really got my hands in the dirt and they, you know, just all sorts of points that they make as a gardener, you were doing the same thing as a painter and you can have the same effect. This is your garden takes time. It's a piece of art. It's constantly evolving. The painting, yes, is done and it's finished. But those painters, they're working with the light, as we know, they're outdoors. And so, as we know with Monet, he was constantly um, following the light and he would get grumpy when the light was poor in his garden at Giverny because he wouldn't be able to go out and paint the way he'd want to paint. Um, and he was not fun to be around. He was quite the burly bear, they would say, um, moaning and groaning about it. But the point is, he was inspired so much by his garden that he was creating a masterpiece in that to paint. And he very rarely painted anything else once he had his garden at Giverny. They speak so eloquently of the elegance and simplicity of a flower and how it can contain worlds. And when a garden is created by an artist, something different happens. And that's what's so beautiful about looking at these gardens through the eye of the painter versus a gardener and why they chose the colors they chose. Um, anyway, so the, <laughs> I'm going on and on. But the film is called Painting the Modern Garden, Monet de Matisse. Look for it in a theater near you. I've linked to the homepage um, of seventhart.com because there's a link you click, it says find a screening, see where it's at. It just again was re-released February, 2024. So if, if your nearby theaters are showing it, it will be available this spring. Highly recommend it. Um, interesting to note though, our, our 
theater shared that only about 60 theaters um, show these exhibitions on screen, but they're so wonderful. I wish, I wish more of them would do it. I'm so grateful that we have one nearby. So again, I highly recommend this film. It is absolutely beautiful. Escape to France, escape to Europe and step foot virtually into the gardens of these artists. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each episode where I'll recommend a book, a film, a show, a recipe, anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Oh, I want to thank you so much for tuning in and wish you a wonderful, wonderful start to spring. Um, it, uh, it's been a delightful first week of spring here in Bend. I, I just, oh, revel in it. I know the rain and is coming and I know we'll have cold days ahead, but, uh, that's what spring is too. Savoring what we get because it all makes a difference in the garden. Um, and wherever we are, whether we have a garden or not, we can walk by one and just revel in the beauty of the blossoms and the daffodils and the tulips and Anyway, I could go on and on. If you are a gardener, the monthly post for the garden um, was on the blog this week, and I share my 15 gardening uh, tools that I love, recommend, and uh, will definitely help you get off to a great start this spring season, as well as share all sorts of tasks that we're up to here in the garden. I say we, the Nell and Norman joined me. And um, photos from the garden. Um, I have a lot of new bulbs in the garden this year. I'm so excited to see them start to bloom here soon. Um, as well as all sorts of new books. Um, and I do include this film in that post as well. So that's on the blog, uh, the garden post for top tier member. It's shared every month and is full of all sorts of photos and videos and inspiration. And some food for thought, whether you are a gardener or not, as we do step into a new season, specifically spring in the Northern Hemisphere, the compost that was is the winter and we're turning it into what it will be. So whatever it is you are working on, what you're growing from or growing through, it's turning into something wonderful, beautiful, and amazing. All right. And the next that new episode will be Wednesday, April 3rd. Until then, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much for tuning in. Bonjour. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, with the shortened URL, tsll.co, or thesimplyluxuriouslife.com. For more in-depth exploration of how to cultivate your own unique, simply luxurious life, pick up my new book, which became both a bestseller and number one new release in France Travel, The Road to Le Papillon, Daily Meditations on True Contentment, available in all four formats for your preferred reading or listening. My first book, titled Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, and my second book, Living the Simply Luxurious Life, are also available in each of the four formats. Readers can now join the more intimate, the Simply Luxurious Life international community by becoming members of the blog, which offers the benefits of ad-free reading site-wide, unlimited access and exclusive access to content on the blog, such as the monthly A Couple Moments with Shannon video chat, tours of my home Le Papillon, the monthly What Made Me Smile post, and monthly Ponderings post, as well as the exclusive opportunity to enter all of the giveaways during the annual French and British weeks. To stay caught up on all things Simply Luxurious, the podcast, blog post, the cooking show, and receive exclusive news, as well as an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart each new month, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Live's free monthly newsletter, arriving on the last day of each month in your inbox. There is also a weekly newsletter, which is also free, and arrives each Friday to keep you caught up on the recent weekly posts on the blog. Enjoy with a hot cuppa or cup of morning coffee, and stay in the know about all things Simply Luxurious. Look for two new episodes of this podcast on the first and third Wednesday of each month. And until next time, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Thank you for tuning in. Bonjour.